Good morning, everyone. So since we cannot um, take you to Ateneo de Manila University right now, we hope that the virtual tour would do justice. Um, welcome again to the Department of Economics and Ateneo Center for Economic Research and Development Seminar Series. Um, thank you to everyone who has been consistently with us um, twice a month um, every on a Wednesday. Um, before we go to the um, introduction of our speaker this morning, let me just remind everyone about our house rules. We will let the speaker finish his presentation first before we entertain questions. Um, Zoom participants, kindly stay muted and stop sharing your video during the duration of the presentation. Um, during Q&A, you may virtually raise your hand and wait to be acknowledged. You may unmute and show yourself when asking your questions. You may also write your questions in the chat box so that you don't forget them. Participants on Facebook, please post your question in the comment sections and we will read them out for you. Slides, videos, and other materials from the seminar are posted on our website only when, speak, when the speaker gives their consent for sharing, them, for sharing them. And today, our speaker gave his consent. We are very lucky to have this morning, Mr. Diwa Gunigundo, who is a former deputy governor for the monetary stability sector at the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, where he served for 41 years. He was behind the adoption of inflation targeting as BSP's monetary policy framework in 2002 and interest rate corridor system for liquidity management in 2016. He was also heavily involved in both rehabilitation and liquidation of distressed banking institutions. He was vice chair chairperson of the BSP's investment management committee that guided the central bank's foreign exchange reserves management. Among the many positions he previously held, this includes alternate, alternate executive director at the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. in 2001 to 2003, and head of research at the Southeast Asian Central Bank Center in Kuala Lumpur in 1992 to 1994. Mr. Gunigundo graduated AB class valedictorian cum laude at the University of the Philippines School of Economics and as a scholar, uh, and he also earned his master's in economics at the London School of Economics as a scholar of the then Central Bank of the Philippines. He holds an honorary doctor of divinity degree from Promise Christian University in Los Angeles, California. He is here with us this morning to share his thoughts on monetary policy and economic recovery. Please help me welcome Mr. Diwa Gunigundo and let us all welcome him on the virtual floor. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Maha. Uh, I see familiar faces and the familiar names of both uh, friends, uh, colleagues, and acquaintances. So it's a great uh, pleasure and uh, honor to speak uh, before you in this lecture series. Uh, the theme of uh, today's uh, lecture is uh, monetary policy and economic recovery. In my lecture today, I will focus on rising risks to monetary policy that is associated with what Herb Hanun of uh, the Bank for International Settlements or BIS refers to as the illusion of unlimited intervention. Let me share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> While monetary policy <clears throat> plays a crucial role in keeping the economy afloat during the pandemic, it should be recognized that it also has its own limits. The road to recovery should take on a whole of government approach. The BSP, which is the country's sole monetary authority, should not be the only game in town, something that I'm quite sure many of us would admit. Now, this slide shows that uh, central banks have always played a vital role in fostering macroeconomic and financial stability. The literature is replete with stories and narratives about central banks 
doing their share in fostering uh, macro and financial stability. The ability of uh, central banks to marshal a series of forceful and uh, timely responses makes them effective macro stabilizing agents during periods of economic and financial stress. Of course, this was stressed by uh, Rajan uh, two, uh, one year ago. Okay? Rajan was uh, the former economic counselor of uh, the IMF. Now, it was therefore not surprising that uh, central banks were once again brought into the forefront of crisis management response with the recent unfolding of the COVID-19 pandemic. Extraordinary times indeed call for extraordinary measures. In the Philippines, the BSP responded to the pandemic with unprecedented measures. The figures in the chart summarizes the timeline of the BSP's monetary policy responses, which consisted of a series of policy rate easing, reduction of reserves, required reserves of the banks, asset purchases, particularly of government securities in the secondary market, among others. There were also regulatory reliefs extended to banks and their clients. The intention was to come and restore confidence in the markets and safeguard macroeconomic stability. Now, <clears throat> how do we describe the responses? How do we assess the responses of the BSP? The BSP's quick and unprecedented monetary response resulted in an absurd easing and improvement in domestic liquidity conditions. In other words, the amount of uh, money in the, in, in the system. Okay? And also contributing to that was the reduction to unprecedented low levels of 2% in terms of the BSP's policy rate. Now, a simple analysis of variance was done on key financial market variables. And what do we see? After the BSP asset purchases, the PSEI tended upwards, increasing by more than 306 points as compared to when the quarantine had just started. This translates to a recovery of about 30%, quickly recovering its losses made during the start of the quarantine period. Likewise, measures of risk premium also eased. The EMBI, this is the Emerging Market Bond Index for the Philippines. This is uh, compiled by JP Morgan for the Philippines decreased by more than 36%, while the 10-year bond yield also declined by about 0.5 points. And the decrease in bond yields for emerging economies is fairly consistent across different EMEs. This is particularly true at the beginning of uh, the pandemic. Now, this would suggest that the BSP's response contributed to con uh, calming the markets. Now, slide four. Even as I say this, we should not lose sight of the limits of monetary policy. Now, Keynes argued that while monetary stimulus can help calm the financial system, they don't necessarily address the underlying causes of a crisis, which in this case is primarily a health issue. Is that actually because demand is low, such that easy monetary policy could induce more credit availments and more investment and production? Demand is low because a lot of people were laid off. Millions lost their jobs. Producers, therefore, lost their markets. Everybody is afraid of the virus. And with the lockdown, personal mobility has been restricted. Access to department stores and supermarkets, theaters, and film centers has been severely limited. For a time, <clears throat> domestic and international travels froze. There was practically no business activity. Now, injecting more liquidity in the system without addressing the underlying problems of the pandemic would be akin to pushing the domestic economy on a string with monetary policy 
becoming less effective. Now, this has actually uh, become more evident as the health crisis dragged on. Despite massive monetary stimulus, the traction of economic recovery remains fragile as macroeconomic indicators continue to emit mixed signals. What is the macroeconomic context of the Philippines during the nearly two years of the health pandemic? Well, <clears throat> number one is the fragile economic recovery. The pandemic pushed the GDP growth to drop by 16.9% in the second quarter of 2020, the lowest recorded growth since 1981. And I'm sure this officially brought the country into economic recession. Now, more than a year into the crisis, the domestic economy is starting to exhibit some early signs of green shoots. In the second quarter of 2021, for example, the Philippine GDP posted a growth of 11.8% in the second quarter of 2021. This was the highest since the fourth quarter of 1988, which posted a growth of 12%, ending the pandemic-driven recession. However, growth has remained fragile as we dig deeper into the numbers. If we consider quarter-on-quarter -quarter changes and strip all seasonalities, the country's GDP actually shrunk by 1.3%. Now, to me, this should suggest that the road to recovery remains fragile, and therefore, it could be long and winding. Now, aside from the weak growth, supply shocks are also exerting upward pressures on overall domestic prices. Now, inflation in September 2021, last, last month, settled at 4.8%, bringing the year-to-date average at about 4.5%, higher than the government target of 2 to 4% this year. Now, this latest CPI outturn is consistent with BSP projections that inflation could remain elevated in the near term before decelerating to within the target range by the end of this year. This is their forecast. I will have more on this when I discuss risks to inflation. Now, let me just highlight at this point the fact that exceeding the inflation targets over a long period could potentially upset inflation expectations of the general public. It can generate second run effects, and this could further entrench higher inflation in the process. Now, the BSP's quick response to address potential liquidity crunch during a crisis led to favorable liquidity situation in the financial system, expanding by nearly 7% year on year in August of 2021. Now, this was faster than the nearly 6% growth recorded in the earlier period of July and on a month on month seasonally adjusted basis. M3 or total domestic liquidity rose by just about 1.2%. Now this is a modest growth path of liquidity because the economy shrank last year through the last two, quarter, the two quarters of 2021 on a decisionalized basis. The chart shows that quite clearly. Sustained injection of liquidity therefore has its limits from the standpoint of future inflation and financial stability. It should be no surprise that bank lending has remained tepid. The latest data shows outstanding loans of universal and commercial banks marginally increased by 1.3% in August after a decline of 0.7% last July of 2021. Now, precisely, this is an example of gains putting, pushing on a string. Despite ample liquidity, credit activity continues to be dampened by heightened risk aversion amid increasing risks to corporate and household balance sheets. Now, if sustained, this absurd procyclicality among banks can be a cause of concern. During times of crisis, banks may need to be countercyclical 
to provide the necessary funding to help boost economic activity. What has happened during this pandemic is that banks ensured their own viability by strengthening their credit standards. And the BSP's uh, own survey of senior loan officers clearly demonstrate that. Now, on the other hand, their clients are having difficult time coping with limited mobility and business activities due to the lockdown. Now, as the economy slumps, we see sour loans climbing up, the non-performing loans. As of end August 2021, for example, gross NPL ratio of the Philippine banking system is stood at 4.5%. Now, this is definitely higher compared to 2.8% a year ago. Now, the uptick in NPL ratio was accompanied by loan loss provisioning with an NPL coverage ratio of nearly 84% versus NPL coverage of more than 100% a year ago. Now, <clears throat> slide 11. Fortunately, the Philippine banking system remains well capitalized. As of the second quarter of 2021, Capital adequacy ratio or CAR was at 17%, well above the 10% minimum threshold set by the BSP itself. Now, and based on the results of BSP's regular and ad hoc simulations, the banking system is reasonably well capitalized and well provisioned. It would be generally advantageous from my own standpoint if there would be more counter cyclical and start lending to various economic sectors, especially the MSMEs. The peso appeared strong last year and for most of 2021. The reason, and we have to realize this, is not that the economy was strong, but on the contrary, the economy was admittedly weak. Demand for imports of both goods and services was very weak because overall domestic demand was also weak. The incentive for outward investment and therefore demand for dollar was non-existent because the pandemic was all around. And this is the reason why in recent months, everything seems to be catching up with us. Of course, while the peso has been trading weaker against the US dollar recently, the movement is actually in line with other Asian currencies. The peso's real effective exchange rate okay, has been relatively stable, even as it has strengthening bias over a longer period because that coincided with the weakening economy at the height of the pandemic. Now, the country's external sector, I would say that the external sector continues to be manageable. The rebound in key economies has uh, sparked external demand. The country's exports, for example, uh, and imports of goods increased by 21.3% and 31.6% resp respectively. Past remittances from overseas Filipinos appear to start recovering with 5.7% growth in January to August 2021 from a 2.6% contraction <coughs> in the same period in 2020. BPO services in the first half of 2021 remained strong despite the disruption to business activities around the world. What about net foreign direct investment? Well, for the first seven months of 2021, there was an increase due to positive foreign investor sentiment on the macro fundamentals and strong growth prospects as appreciated by uh, the foreign investors. The country's outstanding external debt, which rose from about 22% in 2019 to 27% in 2020, seemed to have stabilized at 26.5% by the end of June 2021. Now, what about the country's buffer against external shocks? The gross international reserves of GIR, which stood at more than 107 billion as of September 2021, continue to provide more than adequate external liquidity buffer. And of course, the GIR is supported 
by improving inflows of gas remittances from overseas workers and business process outsourcing. Breaking down the output data would show okay, that all industry subsectors like manufacturing, uh, mining, electricity, and uh, construction have recovered in the first half of 2021. On the other hand, services showed mixed trends given its sensitivity to quarantine measures as seen in accommodation and transport sector. Now, <clears throat> This is the macroeconomic context of what stands of monetary policy the BSP has uh, pursued in the last two years. Despite some improvements in economic activity, the overall momentum of the economic recovery remains tentative as the threat of COVID-19 infections continues. The BSP maintains the view that sustained monetary policy support for domestic demand should help the economic recovery gain more traction. And the BSP has time and again affirmed its strong support to the economy for as long as necessary to ensure the country's strong and sustainable economic recovery. Now, this is its version of forward guidance. This is the version of uh, forward guidance of the BSP. Now, the BSP officials call themselves three team transitory, which means the inflationary supply shocks we are seeing today are considered temporary. There is no basis for an early or preemptive normalization of what is now a very loose monetary policy, given that the policy rate is now negative in real terms. The policy rate is set at uh, 2%, even as the average inflation has averaged four and a half percent for the first nine months of the year. And its projection early this year was above the inflation target of two to four percent. Now, <clears throat> this is the BSP's current set of inflation forecasts. Out of target inflation is expected for 2021. But for the next two years, the BSP expects within target forecast of 3.3% for 2022 and 3.2% uh, for 2023. One can therefore argue that there is no reason for the BSP to revise monetary policy this year and the next two years. Now, I beg to disagree. This is only true if the world stops and everything that we have today stays the same for the next two years. In short, from a risk management standpoint, the BSP may need to refine its stance based on expectations of changes in the next two years. Now, from the standpoint of the negative output gap, for example, an accommodative monetary policy appears reasonable. In previous inflation report, and even today in its pre uh, recent pronouncements uh, in the press, the BSP has made the point that the economy is on demand. Now, based on its previous estimates of uh, potential output, we see on the chart that the negative output gap increased in 2020 at the height of the pandemic and economic decline. Okay? That was in the uh, second uh, quarter of 2020, the lowest uh, uh, actual output. Okay? Now, based on the first two quarters of 2021, we see a declining negative output gap. While the recovery might still be a distance away, monetary policy has to be preemptive as it should be forward-looking. Bottom line, the BSP could still afford to keep a steady monetary policy, but any attempt to do a populist monetary decision could be self-defeating because inflation pressures are now building up and inflation expectations might get entrenched on the upward path. Now, this slide shows that our weak pandemic response has been quite costly. It made a big dent in both consumption and investment. From the latest estimate, it would take at least 10 years before we recover from the decline in financial investment alone. 
But uh, in terms of uh, uh, the foregone items, that's more than 4 trillion pesos. These are all expressed in net uh, present value. For the next uh, 40 years, the crisis cost of the Philippine economy, okay, 41.4 trillion in terms of foregone consumption and investment, is an economic challenge that will be difficult to address via monetary measures. The BSP will be extending so much, okay? If we go by a monetary policy alone, in excess liquidity or lower cost of money with very little expected perceptible result in terms of incentivizing some improvement in credit demand, investment, and production. Now, slide 20 shows that the reimposition of lockdown measures also threatens economic recovery. Now, according to these trends, mobility in the Philippines tightened in August of 2021. Of course, this is uh, prior to the easing of, uh, of the lockdowns uh, recently because of the reimposition of ECQ in some areas of the country. Now, for this reason, we might have to be less bullish about the growth prospects for the third quarter Although some quarters chose uh, to maintain their guarded optimism. Now, it's difficult to imagine business revival when personal mobility remains uncertain because our ability to contain the pandemic is also quite, uh, quite weak. Now, here, there are risks. And here, there is a mixed trend. Business respondents are not very confident of the economy this third quarter of 2021, as it came down from 1.4 positive to minus five, okay? But more optimistic in the fourth quarter and the next 12 months. In short, business activities are not expected to recover very strongly and very soon. Now, business expansion plans and employment plans, that's on the, uh, on the right-hand side, are quite encouraging because they demonstrate continued breaking up in terms of future plans, both for investment and unemployment. Now slide 22 is for consumer expectation survey. And here we see consumers continue to be less pessimistic because their current sentiment remains in the negative territory. There's an increase from uh, minus 54.5 to minus 30.9 to minus 19.3 in the third quarter of uh, 2021, but this is still in the negative ter territory. For the future, they are more optimistic from 1.3 to 2.7 for the next quarter and 19.8, uh, 18.6, around the same for the next uh, 12 months, okay? This is also shown by their sentiment towards spending more in the last quarter of 2021. If this holds, and business responds with excess liquidity in the system, abetting it, there could be more brisk business activities, but with some inflationary run-ups. Another way of looking at uh, market confidence is to look at the forecasts of international financial institutions and credit rating agencies and other market analysts. In general, they share the same outlook. The Philippine economic recovery might be a long way off. The IMF, the World Bank, ADB, AMRO, they all downgraded their growth forecasts for the Philippines for 2021. Credit rating agencies also downgraded their credit outlook, although they decided to keep their rating on the Philippines steady at investment grade. The reasons, inadequate pandemic containment, too restrictive economic lockdowns, such that the country's potential output has gone down as well. Now, market confidence can also be uh, influenced by the kind of political leadership in place. Now, this uh, shows uh, how the different presidencies fared in terms of the corruption index. Okay? Note that all of all the presidencies after Cory Aquino, only those of FBR and Noinoy did we see an improvement in the corruption index. All the others showed some decline. 
This index is very important because in more, way, in more ways than one, it tells us whether the political leadership has the political will to address important economic issues, the like economic recession, inflation, income inequality, even pandemic uh, uh, containment. Now, in this chart, I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's quite small. We see that the public perception about inflation management is the least approved, okay? It has the, uh, it has the lowest uh, approval rating of 37 versus fighting criminality of 74 as of September of 2021, or the most is approved. Now, this is bad for public perception. This is bad for public confidence in anti-inflation policies of the central bank. Now, this pandemic crisis, true to the IMF's description, that it is like no other crisis, has different layers of macroeconomic impact. With a weak health system, we could not do good testing and tracing. We could not properly isolate and treat with the same pace as the viral scourge. We depended so much on lockdowns. As a result, there have been significant economic scarring, hysteresis, if you will. Our growth slumped the deepest. Many laborers were laid off together with their income. People had begun to entertain different views about whether they should get vaccinated or not. Economic and financial imbalances, especially in the banking system, ensued economic structure change in favor of those sectors with digital solutions, if at all. Our policy offsets in terms of expansionary fiscal and monetary policy were limited. So like all scars, our own economic scars might be prolonged. And this chart shows it. Among those covered in this chart done by the, by the economists with data from Oxford Econo Economics and the IMF, the chart would show that the Philippines would suffer the deepest scars and therefore our economic recovery would be one of the longest. How does one address that issue through monetary policy? A prolonged monetary policy accommodation? Now, there are two challenges to inflation management, not only here, but throughout the world. One is the increasing oil prices. Since the second quarter of 2020, oil prices have sustained that increases. During this month of October, oil prices have already exceeded the $80 per barrel. Many forecasters assumed oil prices averaging only $60 to $70 per barrel. For this reason, people may have to recast their forecasts. BSP has to pay attention to this big threat to price stability because fuel and other forms of energy are now showing tight supply because of, among others, underinvestment in oil rigs and oil well. Of course, there are now alternative sources of energy, but it would take more years before we're able to wean away ourselves from fossil fuel. And the holiday season is just around the corner. Two, supply disruptions and delayed deliveries are now being felt globally. There is a general breakdown in investment and production in China and other key production capitals in the world. Transport logistics are becoming more challenged. While indeed, current forecasts for the next two years may be within target and that output gap has some more room for accommodative monetary policy, it would be useful to review not only the forecasts, but also the appropriate monetary policy stance. Now, slide 28. At the onset with pandemic, bond yields and volatility increased along with elevated premiums demanded for holding Philippine government bonds. This prompted the BSP to implement monetary and liquidity enhancing measures, including the buying of government securities in the secondary market to reassure market participants of demand for GS should they need to liquidate their holdings. Now, what else can we say about this chart? Well, the yields seem stabilizing, and they are. We should note that the yields on long-dated 
securities, the five years, the 10 years, and the 20 years have remained elevated. And that the differential relative to the three months and one year instruments have actually widened. This actually confirms our fear that the market might be expecting higher inflation in the future. Yes, the economy appears to be in an expansion mode, but the trend is yet to stabilize. There is still a great deal of volatility. There is still a great deal of uncertainty about the future. Beyond this risk that should tell us monetary policy is not all about deciding whether the shocks are coming from the supply or demand side, whether they are temporary or permanent, monetary policy is much more beyond that. Economic models can capture the most quantifiable and obvious drivers of growth and inflation. But while the, with the pandemic factor, there is a lot of uncertainty, not the least of which is the capability of our health authorities to do the right thing at the right time never allowing friendship or politics to get in the way of data or science. With the pandemic factor, economic lockdowns were unavoidable, especially in the light of our inadequate health infrastructure. At this point, let me argue that monetary policy alone is not sufficient to ensure economic recovery. Ensuring the growth recovery path entails a whole of government approach Monetary policy is hardly the only game in town. Allow me to share some areas of opportunities where authorities' collaborative efforts could focus on. And I, I think I will be very quick here, okay? First, the pandemic is primarily a public sector crisis. This means that the problems associated with the crisis can be tackled more directly by fiscal policy, while monetary policy is only addressing a secondary shock, the financial repercussions of the shock to the real economy. The pandemic has also shown several advantages of the digital economy. The private sector can lead in the innovation of digital products and services that would allow us to increase the breadth and reach of markets even in these difficult times. Data shows but the volume of electronic payments has significantly grown this year, okay? Banks can be skewed to digital banking to reduce transaction costs, improve services, and reduce, most important, virus transmission. Of course, the challenge to the regulators and operators of these digital platforms is to ensure integrity of the whole process. The pandemic has also taught us to take care of our environment, a green and inclusive recovery will significantly enhance the resilience of our economies and societies in the face of both the severe recession and accelerating environmental challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude this presentation with a commentary on the macroeconomic outlook. Needless to say, this macroeconomic scenario depends immensely on the ability of the authorities to contain the pandemic and usher in some easing in economic lockdown. This is how to enable economic recovery. It's good the Development Budget Coordinating Committee decided to keep its feet on the ground and adjusted the target from 6 to 7% this year to a more realistic 4 to 5%. And next year will definitely be another challenging year because of the lingering economic scars on economic activities, employment, and productivity. I'm not very optimistic that the BSP will be able to deliver on its target of two to four percent this year. It's likely to lie between four to five percent. And obviously, the pandemic and sustained interest spending will keep the fiscal deficit to over nine percent the highest ever, with some moderation to 7.5% still on the very high side next year. The issue is the financiability of the budget deficit, considering the difficult revenue situation. Now, if the macro situation improves next year, 
and the government goes slow in external borrowing, we don't expect the GIR to move up significantly to where the level is right now. While the recent monetary policy actions have helped support the economy amid the crisis, the current pandemic requires a well-coordinated mix of policy responses. Reliance on monetary policy alone to bring our economy back on track to sustainable growth, unfortunately, may be an illusion. This could dangerously lead to what Orpanides, you know, <clears throat> the uh, former governor of uh, the Bank of Cyprus, refers to as overburdening of monetary policy and eventually diminish and compromise the independence of central banks, which in turn could reduce their effectiveness to maintain price stability and limit their ability to contribute to crisis management moving forward. Over time, I would like to believe that sustainability will require some long-term measures to be in place, like improved healthcare, education, and training, and capacity building. Monetary policy, while a useful tool, also has its limits. Whole of government approach where fiscal policy and monetary policy go hand in hand is needed to rebuild the domestic economy. The BSP and monetary policy cannot be the only game in town. Thank you very much for your patience. All right, uh, thank you very much uh, for that really um, informative and interesting presentation. Um, I'd like to note that we have nearly 200 participants, 98 here on Zoom, and we have about 94 um, participants viewing on Facebook Live. Okay, so at this point, um, we would like to entertain questions from the audience. So again, for um, audience in the Zoom, you may um, raise your hands, virtually raise your hands and um, state your name and your institutional affiliation. And for those on Facebook, you can write your questions in the comment section and we will read them out for you. So now the floor is open for, um, for your questions. Just unmute yourself and ask your um, question. Anybody who would like to start? We check the one on Facebook. Alvin? Oh, na lang ako lang nagtatanong kay Sir Dila. Sir, um, thank you for the presentation. Just so just one thing, no? because the banks are not lending. Uh, yesterday, BDO released their their uh, income results, and they said they they are back to pre-pandemic level. So, uh, uh, Sir Shell and I and our uh, our forecasting team in assert we have always noted that the banking sector or finance industry in general uh, always uh, wins, regardless if there's a crisis or not. So, uh, in this context. Um, I have not really seen the details of how BDO made that uh, recovery pre -pandem back to pre-pandemic when they are were supposed to be a bank that who's supposed to be lending and earning from lending. So uh, is there any connection um, in, in, uh, in, in you know, the engagement in other non-general non banking transactions that, you know, uh, are benefiting from the monetary policies uh, of the BSP rather than the rather than the uh, intended approach to to reflate uh, the, the economy. Well, thank you very much for that uh, <clears throat> question, Alvin. Uh, very a, a very good question. I can think of two things. I'm not privy also to BDO. <laughs> okay, one fees and charges. Okay. Uh, whenever the banks are into crisis situation and uh, there is uh, some limits to how much they can lend out, normally um, uh, they would depend on higher fees and charges. That's one. Two, if you recall, the BSP <clears throat> reduced the reserve requirement by uh, what, 200, 300 basis points. Okay. 
Now, what is that? Uh, what does that mean to the banks and including BDO? Okay, at some point, they were keeping their money if the um, if the reserve requirement, let's say, is ten percent, ten percent of their deposit. So if their deposit is one trillion, for example, or 100 billion, for example, 10 percent of 100 billion is 10 billion. That is kept with the BSP, and the BSP does not pay interest on that 10 billion pesos. Now the BSP, uh, precisely because of this pandemic, decided to loosen monetary policy, and one way of doing that is reducing the required bank reserves. So it frees. That ten percent, for example, no? <clears throat> or for example, a, a, a certain portion of the reserves, back to the banks. Now, where did the banks uh, channel these resources if they are not lending? Well, they simply deposit, redeposited the same amount of money back to the BSP before they were not paid any single centavo, but today they are paid on overnight 2%, okay? But of course, uh, when they uh, deposit it uh, uh, at higher levels, at higher maturities, they get more. So I think that is one of the uh, countervailing uh, income uh, derived by the banks from the required reserves, from the reduction of the required reserves. You will also see that uh, banks were very active in uh, government securities, okay? Both government securities and BSP uh, uh, securities or uh, certificates of indebtedness are both risk-free, and uh, they pay they pay quite handsomely. So even if the banks are not uh, lending, uh, they have a way of uh, recovering this uh, foregone income from lower lending or not lending at all. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from. Um... Zoom audience, Francisco Dison, would you like to ask your question yourself and kindly tell us your institutional affiliation? Francisco Dison? Just unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, I'm from uh, no, Sun Savings Bank. No? And my question to uh, Governor Gunigundo is uh, what is the effect of the high uh, of this continued uh, deficit spending by the government, uh, resulting in a very high jet debt to GDP ratio, supposedly now around 63%, when it should be normally around 20 to 30% only. No? And uh, so what will be the effect on inflation, on future economic growth of such a continuing policy? Because obviously the government's not collecting enough taxes and yet it wants to spend a lot. No? And we will see that happening, I guess, in the coming elections next year. No? Uh, the budget has gone up significantly no, for the coming year. No? And most of that will be spent uh, in the first half, I suppose, no? uh, so that the present administration can win again. No? Uh, so how, would you like to comment on that scenario? Uh, yeah, so sure. Like, good, no? <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, when we talk of um, outstanding debt of uh, the national government, we're talking of about uh, 11.6 or 11.7 trillion pesos as of the end of July 2021. Now, it's not 20%. Uh, the, the metrics is not 20%. The metrics is about, I think, 40 to 50%. Now, <clears throat> if you take a look, uh, let's say at uh, 2017, 2018, and uh, 2019, we were there. No? Um, debt to GDP uh, in 2017 was about 40%, also in 2018, and also in 2019. In other words, we were able to keep uh, fiscal deficit to GDP ratio at about uh, 2 to 3 or 2 to 4%, and therefore the need to borrow from uh, uh, from the capital markets is much less compared to today. So we were able to keep it at about 40%. But in 2020, it went up to 54.6. And then by uh, the end of July, exceeded 60%. Okay. Now, first of all, uh, I see no 
there is nothing patently wrong with uh, deficit spending of government, especially uh, during this uh, pandemic. However, we can have more comments on how the borrowed funds were spent. For example, we know that in the Senate, there is public hearing about Parmalee. There is also a public, there is also hearing about star pay. In other words, yes, we borrowed resources because we needed more money to help contain the pandemic. But it's one thing to, uh, to incur higher deficit and incur more, more debts because of that. But it's another thing to misspend the money that you borrowed from the capital markets. And to me, that is what is that is what that is what is the, the, the that is the, the the issue at this point. Now, um, so moving forward, if there is correct priority of budgetary allocation, for example, we can spend less on anti-insurgency and spend more on uh, on uh, the medical sector and 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 education. We can spend less on uh, intelligence fund of uh, the executive, et cetera, okay? And spend more time, spend more, more resources on uh, health, on education and other social services. If we do that, if we are able to spend wisely, especially on infrastructure, on needed infrastructure, okay? We would be able to grow over time. And as we grow over time, we should be able to pay back, okay? To pay back what we incurred in terms of uh, in terms of debt precisely to cover our uh, higher fiscal deficit and higher debt to GDP ratio. This is no different from our situation in the 1980s, no? from the mid 80s up to the early 1990s. Some people were also saying, of course, that uh, we should have repudiated our foreign debt because uh, most of this uh, were misspent, et cetera, et cetera. But the government at the time decided to pay back all of its loans to uh, the international capital markets. And we were able to get more investments from abroad. We were able to grow out of our debt. And today, prior to the pandemic, we were quite good in terms of uh, our footing in public finance. Uh, debt to GDP ratio was about 40%. Our external debt to GDP ratio was also uh, lower than the metrics prescribed by the International Monetary Fund. In short, what I'm saying is, Yes, we can, we can borrow, but if we are not using the borrowed funds wisely, then we would be back to where we started in the 1980s. So uh, bottom line, we can borrow, but make sure that the borrowings go to the right places. Now, if this continues and we don't have the right priorities in budgetary allocation, what will happen is number one, the government will simply be uh, monetizing the debt. There, number two, the central bank will be forced to inject more liquidity into the system. Three, we will have more inflation. And number four, because of that, I think our growth prospects will not be as bright as we want it to be. Thank you. Okay, um, let me read a question from Facebook from one of our milestone followers. Monzen Maliari. The question is, what is the role of smaller banks in a scenario where bigger commercial or universal banks are still hesitant to lend? Well, small banks have this advantage because they are small, like rural banks, for example, thrift banks. They know their customers. Now, if you know their customers, you know their, their credit worthiness, okay? And therefore, you can afford to continue lending to these people whom you know. Now, the problem with, of course, with big banks uh, um, normally, no, and this is, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm saying this as a general case. Okay, they, 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 they spend time in terms of ensuring that they are lending to the right borrowers, so that costs money. And because there is imperfect information, you charge them higher. In the same way that uh, the banks during this pandemic decided to tighten their credit standards and in the process restrict lending to the economic sectors because they are not sure. 
whether these corporates will be able to pay back their loans. And this is something that, that, is, that is true. Uh, the NPLs of the banks are rising because many of these corporates are also experiencing distresses in their, in their balance sheets and in their financial statements, They're in their bottom lines. In short, uh, if you're not sure whether you would lend because you have imperfect information, the normal thing to do is to restrict lending. And to be, uh, to be correct, to be politically correct, you say that these are our rules. In other words, your credit standards have been tightened. In the case of the small banks, their advantage is that they know their clients and therefore they don't have to spend so much money trying to figure out the credit worthiness of their prospective borrowers. And they have a niche, no? they have a niche. Some small banks uh, uh, focus on uh, real estate. Some small banks uh, focus on agriculture, okay? Uh, or, you know, uh, these, are, these are niche, uh, niche uh, uh, banking on the part of, uh, of, of the smaller banks. That's their advantage and that's their role. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have another question from one of the audience in Zoom. Bing Ikamina, kindly tell us your institutional affiliation and you may ask the question. Please um, be direct to the point so we may accommodate other questions. Thank you very much. Anyway, uh, being uh, uh, Mr. Diwa, I know we know each other. <laughs> anyway, uh, I know being being is my paternity brother. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, as you mentioned, and uh, I, I suppose everyone agrees, the monetary policy is not the only game in town. Nonetheless, it plays a role in the recovery strategy, of course. And uh, for next year, uh, what do you think the stance of the B BSP? Or would take, and as far as you're concerned, what 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 is your you know what do you think the stance should be? Uh, uh, I ask that uh, given the fact that uh, recently we uh, there, there were some concerns about you know uh, in the banking industry, some analysts that uh, because of this rising inflation, maybe in the second quarter of next year the BSP should start. Uh, looking at maybe uh, trying to address these issues to, to monetary means, I mean, because of the potential, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, second one, increase of this, uh, especially oil prices on, on inflation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bing. No? Uh, I wouldn't want to preempt uh, the BSP on its uh, future move, uh, because uh, BSP is always a uh, database, and uh, it is uh, guided by its forecast of future inflation. Now, under an inflation targeting uh, framework uh, of monetary policy, when they see that the future inflation is uh, within the target, they don't have to do anything. In fact, if there is uh, additional room uh, for accommodation, I'm sure the BSP, in the spirit of helping in economic recovery, would even reduce the already negative uh, real policy rate, okay? But I was say, saying earlier, I was suggesting earlier that there could be two things that could force the hand of the BSP not only to keep policy rates steady, but perhaps uh, consider a possible revision of monetary policy stance. One is uh, uh, high oil prices, $80 per barrel, in excess of $80 per barrel, and uh, based on some uh, market uh, assessments and uh, study of the oil industry, this may not be transitory, okay? But this could be a more permanent fixture of the industry for the next two to three, two to uh, uh, four years. So therefore, uh, I don't think uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the BSP uh, will keep to its, uh, will keep to its, um, uh, forecast if the oil prices, the, uh, the, the, the prospects of oil prices are going up. That's one. Second is uh, global value chain disruption. Okay? Now, if disruptions in terms of supply chain uh, are, are now getting to be more evident and it is affecting uh, everyone, uh, there could be some problems in terms of production. And we all know that, uh, that uh, this could also upset uh, the inflation uh, 
the inflation forecasts, uh, and therefore uh, that could also influence the hand of uh, the BSP when it considers uh, uh, monetary policy, not, not this year, but in the following year, uh, 2022. Now, the other point I want to emphasize also is inflation expectations, okay? It is true that uh, perhaps on the basis of uh, uh, the BSP's uh, forecasts, uh, the forecasts might still indicate within target forecasts. But if the, if the, if the rest of the uh, community, the rest of the market believes that uh, you know, there is more permanence to uh, high oil prices and its impact on uh, consumer prices, as well as uh, value chain uh, uh, disruption. And this may not uh, necessarily be uh, uh, considered immediately. I think uh, this will have to be considered by uh, the BSP when it recasts its uh, forecast for 2022 and, uh, and 2023. I'm sure they'll be do that. They will be doing that in the last uh, two meetings of the Monetary Board for 2021. Okay, um, before I call on the ones who are in Zoom, let me uh, read the question from one of, the of our followers on Facebook, Neil Angelo Canlas Halcon. This may be a follow-up uh, question to the earlier one. Should BSP become hawkish in order to bring inflation down to its target by next year, since inflation in the first nine months has averaged more than 4%? Well, um, monetary policy does not have to do anything at this point uh, because as uh, indicated by uh, the BSP uh, forecast towards the end of 2021 and for the next two years, 2021, 2022, uh, the forecasts indicate 3.3 uh, and 3.2%. Uh, now, if we are looking at uh, the last uh, few months of 2021, it's already late. Uh, the BSP's moves today will affect uh, inflation next year and the year after, not the next three months of 2020, uh, uh, 2021. And uh, if we take a look at uh, some of the numbers that uh, we uh, that we um, we presented earlier, uh, perhaps uh, perhaps uh, the uh, the uh, the current forecasts of uh, the BSP make sense. However. Uh, if we take a look at the current, uh, at the dynamics of the current information that we have about oil prices and global value chain disruption, I was saying earlier that the BSP may have to review and recast their forecast for 2020, uh, 22 and 2023. And if they say that the forecast for 22 and 23 are such that they could be beyond two to 4%, then uh, Mr. Halcon has a point that the BSP may have to uh, move away from uh, being dovish to a more hawkish stance of monetary policy. But the BSP will have to be gradual. It will have to be uh, more circumspect because the recovery of the Philippine economy is still fragile. It is still weak. Okay, uh, I think um, National Scientist Emil Javier is raising his hand. Okay, Paul, please. Uh, magandang umaga sa ating lahat, <coughs> si Emil Javier from uh, the National Academy. Uh, Governor, to what extent is agriculture contributing to the inflation? And uh, moving forward, what do you think should the monetary uh, board or, or agriculture itself should do to help uh, moderate inflation moving forward? Uh, maganda, pong, ano, maganda pong tanong yun. Kasi if we take a look at the consumer basket, uh, food and other food commodities uh, comprise nearly what? 49-50% of the total consumer basket. So a lot of the uh, dynamics in the agricultural sector, particularly food, actually influence uh, uh, the trends of, uh, of inflation. Now, the BSP has uh, actually uh, partnered with uh, both the executive and the legislative uh, branches of government by ensuring, one, that the agricultural sector may be helped through the proceeds of the tariff duties on the uh, following the rice tarification bill. 
In other words, we have not been competitive uh, in the agricultural sector. And therefore, um, I'm sure next year, um, we, we, we should be able to recast the budget and spend more on agriculture, uh, science and technology, okay? And I think we should not also abandon the rice tarification um, law, as well as uh, the increase in the minimum access volume, particularly of pork. Because of uh, the African swine fever, uh, we experienced uh, a lot of shortage in pork, but uh, we were able to, 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 to lick this problem precisely because the government decided to increase the minimum access volume with minimal uh, adjustment in the tariff. So now we, while indeed pork prices are still high, it could, they could have been higher without the increase in the minimum access volume for pork. Now in terms of rice, we have seen how uh, the rice tarification uh, law has resulted in more imports more tariff duties and the, 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 the proceeds from this, uh, from this tariff duties were channeled to the agricultural sector for the research and the development uh, purposes. I think we need to have a more targeted, more, more uh, direct uh, uh, assistance or support to the agricultural sector in terms of infrastructure, warehousing, uh, warehousing, uh, drying facilities, uh, milling, uh, and of course, uh, the, the rest of the public works infrastructure. Matagal na pong uh, na-neglect ang agrikultura sa ating bansa. Kaya if we are able to address that 49 to 50% component of the consumer basket because of food, I think we should be able, monetary policy will find it easier uh, to maintain uh, price stability. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Let me call Louis Dumlao and then Sarah Daway Dukanes uh, who have questions. Louis, please be direct to the point so we can accommodate two other uh, questions here on Zoom. Yeah, so I, I'll just be direct, okay? Uh, I'll just read out what I typed out. Uh, unless I misread it, uh, kasi in your projection, it's 2 to 4% inflation for 2021 and $114 billion GIR for 2021. Uh, so average inflation is 4.4%. If annual is to reach 4%, inflation in October, November, and December has to average 2.8%. Uh, how confident are you for 2021 uh, to, to reach that target between 2 to 4% and how? And second question is... Uh, oh, no, before, you, before you go to the second question, let me just clarify yeah, uh, that the 2 to 4% is not my target. That is the target of the government. That's okay. why I was saying... I'm not confident that the BSP will be able to deliver on the target of two to four percent. See, I was trying okay. to assess the uh, you know the um, viability of having a target of two to four percent. If for the first nine months of the year you already have a 4.4, 4.5 percent average, 4 .4, I don't yeah. believe. Uh, yeah, I don't believe that uh, uh, we would be able to reach uh, two to four percent for the year. Yeah. Your so with that, question. what is your disposition of the government? Sabi mo kasi government eh. yeah. What is your disposition of government projecting 114 billion dollars of GIR? We are whereas we are now around 107 as of last statistic in September. So san manggagaling yung? Where are they thinking? Well, again, that is the program? target of uh, the government. Yeah. Okay, this came from the DBCC Development Budget coordinating committee. My input uh, this morning is simply to say, is this uh, feasible? Is this uh, not feasible, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, what is my take on, uh, uh, on the uh, gross international research? Yes, at this point, as of the end of September, the GIR uh, uh, was at about um, $107 billion. And uh, the government is uh, looking at uh, much more than that, okay, at the level much more than that. That's why I was very skeptical about, uh, about the possibility not, not only of reaching it, but also of maintaining it. Why? Because uh, remember in 2020 and early part of 2021, we started borrowing in large amounts 
from external sources. Okay? And these are not long-term, okay? except for those from uh, international financial institutions or uh, the development banks like ADB and, and, and World Bank. But these are more or less uh, short-term. And by 2022 and 2023, we should be starting to, to repay uh, most of these loans. And therefore, it is very difficult to say that uh, you would have a GIR of as high as uh, 110 or 114 uh, uh, billion dollars. That's one. Two, uh, if your balance of payments uh, will yield surpluses for 2022 and 2023, and I doubt it because uh, you have a recovering an economy that is about to recover. Normally, when the economy starts to recover, your imports start shooting up. Uh, and therefore, your current account also goes up. If there is not enough investments and loans to upset the, the uh, increase in the current account deficit, then you would have, uh, you would have reduction instead of uh, improvement in the gross international reserves. So yes, I, I share your I share your uh, your skepticism uh, about this rather high uh, gross international reserves as targeted by uh, by the government. Thank you. Another question from Sara Dukanes. Sara, you may unmute yourself. Good morning. Thank you, Maha, for acknowledging my hand raising. And thank you, Mr. Gunigundo, for a uh, very uh, illuminating presentation. But uh, you mentioned earlier that we are in a regime of negative real interest rates, which ordinarily should spur investments. Uh, however, you also mentioned banks are not lending more in spite of the loose monetary environment or monetary policy environment. And uh, you know, these may have uh, adverse implications on uh, private investments and uh, also uh, on our recovery. So if this environment of negative real interest uh, rates will persist, and uh, well, it seems to me like uh, it will, how will this affect long-term investments in the country in general? and the type and quality of investments uh, that might be made today, and maybe some implications for the type of recovery that we might experience. Thank you. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we are living in pandemic times, uh, Sara. So, therefore, um, there is what we call um, lingering effects of the pandemic. Everybody uh, is afraid to go out to spend, you know, mm -hmm. even to yes. invest and produce because of economic scarring. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, um, so a lot, as I said, and I emphasized in my presentation, a lot depends on the government's ability to neutralize the virus and announce to the whole world, announce to the Philippines that uh, we have been able to contain, uh, to contain the virus, number one, Number two, uh, many of our, our people, 70, 80 percent of our people have already been vaccinated. And therefore, uh, in, in one sense of the word herd immunity, we have achieved it. Although now people are, are. Yes. Although people are now talking of just not just 80 or 90 percent uh, herd immunity, it should be 100 percent. Just the way uh, Israel uh, proved that uh, you don't you, you, you don't get much from 70 or 80%. Right now, even people are talking of booster shots. Mm -hmm. okay? So unless the pandemic is, uh, is uh, really uh, contained and contained decisively and everybody uh, agrees and are, are, are become optimistic, it will be difficult to engineer uh, investment uh, uh, and even consumption-led kind of uh, mm -hmm. economic, economic recovery. Even if you maintain a... Uh, a negative real uh, policy rate at this point. Uh, the, by the way, the transmission from the BSP to the banks has some kind of a disconnect. Why? Because the policy rate of the BSP is at 2%. The inflation rate is uh, probably 4.4 or 4.5% average for the entire year of uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. But the banks are charging much higher interest rates in terms of lending and very low uh, deposit rates. So actually uh, the, the, the spread uh, makes them more actually more profitable 
Okay. And this is because of the asymmetric information that you mentioned earlier. That's right. The pre That's right. Pre so I was, I was saying it, it, it will really be uh, very difficult precisely because of one chart that I showed earlier where uh, the economists showed uh, from the data of Oxford uh, Economics and the IMF that based on the deep economic scars that we sustained during the pandemic, we would also be one of the, uh, the last to recover. So that's where I'm coming from, okay? Uh, and therefore, fiscal policy will have to do the heavier lifting. But not only heavier lifting, correct heavier lifting. Because it's easy to spend, but those expenditure might end up in the pockets of just several people. I mean, we should be able to, uh, we should be able to ensure that public expenditures mm -hmm. are, uh, are going to the right places yeah. Uh, especially in correct infrastructure, social services, education, health. I think these are very critical, uh, critical okay. areas with long-term, positive long-term uh, public goods effect. So we're really living in a Keynesian world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Okay, last two questions. I'm going to read out the second last. Uh, this is from Renato Aniel, who is a retired investment banker. Uh, the question is, with our debt now at more than 60% of our GDP and with increased deficit spending by the government, do we see our credit rating with international rating agencies deteriorating? Will this not result more in expensive debt exacerbating further the government and national financial situation? I agree. Uh, you have a point there. Um, right now, I, was, I showed the EMBI, no? the Emerging Market Bond Index, as more or less stable. And the credit rating agencies have kept the um, uh, rating uh, of, the BS, of the Central of the uh, Philippines at uh, investment grade. However, if you take a look, many of these uh, credit rating agencies have downgraded the prospects or the outlook from stable to negative. Now, in the, in the credit rating processes, if there is a downgrade of your outlook, in the next 18 months, that investment, that investment grade rating that we have might be reviewed by the credit rating agencies. And on the basis of what they see, and you know, they, they come at least twice a year, uh, they might decide to downgrade our rating, not just the outlook, from stable to negative, but a rating, right now we are either triple B or triple B plus, okay? A rating of uh, triple B uh, to minus uh, triple B or a triple B plus to a triple B might be a very bad signal to the market. And when we see uh, both the EMBI spreads, not tightening, but widening, and the credit default swap uh, spreads start to widen, as well, both the government as well as corporate borrowers abroad will have some difficulty trying to figure out how to get out of this, uh, of this mess. So I was saying earlier, we should get our house in order. It's a, it's, it needs a whole of government approach. Uh, we have to have the budget uh, really spent on the right and critical uh, objects of, of public uh, spending then we should be able to grow because it's a question of, of, of confidence. If people are confident that the government will do the right thing and not misspend, okay, uh, the tax revenues and the borrowed funds, they will have more confidence going out, especially if the pandemic has been contained, going out, spending, uh, uh, getting people uh, or employing people, producing, investing, etc then we should be able to get our economy going and we should be able to outgrow uh, this, uh, uh, this accumulating uh, public as well as private debts. Yeah. Okay, the last question is coming from one of your huge fans, Manuel Goseco. Manuel? Okay, well, I'll just read it uh, from the comments. You know, uh, basically, how, how high will this debt to GDP will be? you know, will go, right? Because we're already at 60%. We came in from 40, 
And, uh, you know, we're not supposed to be looking at the 80% according to the IMF at that time. And then how, how long will it take us to bring it back to 40%? We took many years to bring it back from 70% in the early 2000s back to the 40s. Second, uh, and then my follow-up question is there. I noticed that the external debt in the BSP SD, SDDS website is at 101 billion and the reserves is 107. So are we now in danger of flipping from creditor to borrower? I mean, we, we are still a net creditor to the world, but we would probably, we could switch again back to borrower, no? I, and it would be kind of a, not exactly a good signal, I would say. Your thoughts on that as well? Well, it is very difficult to say how far it will go. Right now, it's about uh, 60, uh, 60 percent, no, 60.4 percent at the end of July. Um, and um, because of uh, the very difficult uh, uh, revenue situation, and we need to spend, uh, the government might be forced to continue um, borrowing and borrowing in a big way. And there are new demands of the budget, from the budget. One is the Mandana's law. Mandana's law means uh, more uh, portions of the uh, uh, internal revenue allotment will have to go to uh, the local government units precisely because the computation is now more generalized, including tariff duties, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a higher demand. Number two is, uh, of course, the pension of uh, the uniformed uh, personnel. In other words, the military and the police. And unfortunately, they don't have any counterpart funding. In short, if we, the private sector on, and the government employees, uh, our employers deduct portion of our salaries as contribution to GSIS and SSS, in the case of the military, they don't have that, okay? But nonetheless, they're entitled to pension. Now, that is a big uh, demand on the budget. Now, if this is going to continue next year, then there is greater pressure for, uh, for government uh, to borrow. At the same time, uh, if indeed the 70 to 80% herd immunity is not enough and we have to move to 100%, and uh, not only that, even the youthful ones among us, meaning uh, below 17, should receive uh, uh, the vaccines, then the government would have to spend more, okay? So uh, it will have to borrow more if, if revenues are not forthcoming uh, immediately. So it's very difficult at this point uh, um, uh, to, 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 to forecast where, how far it will go. Because if you take a look at the... Uh, uh, deficit to GDP ratio, which is which came from the DBCC, it's more than nine percent this year, and uh, next year probably would be about seven. It's still high, okay? Because in the past we were talking of between two to four percent, so it's it's still very high. And therefore, uh, if the net numbers uh, were to be given credence, and I'm sure that they are correct, uh, it will take ten years uh, for financial investment to be recovered. Um, and to pandemic pre-pandemic levels, I, I don't want to I don't want to connect the dots, but I don't want it to last for the next uh, uh, ten years. Uh, we, as well as our children, deserve a better deal. Thank you very much. Now, on the second point of uh, of Mr. Guseco, and uh, this is about um, this is about uh, uh, whether we should. You know, um, we'll turn net creditors. Yeah, net market. creditors relative to um, our 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 reserves versus our external debt. Of course, uh, number one, um, the external debt consists of both uh, government and uh, private uh, indebtedness. Okay, so should the government uh, need uh, need the money? Okay, uh, after all, uh, the government. Owes, uh, the B, owns the BSP. The external uh, debt is about uh, uh, equivalent of about 3.5 trillion. So around 50% of that. So in other words, less than 50 billion. And we have uh, nearly 100 billion dollars in, uh, uh, in total reserves. No? Now, secondly, 
the reserves of the BSP might be considered to be secondary reserves because even our commercial banks have their FCDUs, foreign currency deposit units. That's owned by both the households and the corporate sector. So before they depend on the uh, gross international reserves of the country, they will have to tap uh, the first line of defense, which is their own uh, dollar reserves kept at the commercial banks in terms of foreign currency deposit units. But yes, you were right. At some point, uh, our reserves were much higher than our total external debt. And we would like to see it restored uh, very soon rather than later. Thank you very much. Okay, um, it's already 11.28. We really appreciate um, your giving an extra time to accommodate all the questions. Sure, At sure. this point, I'd like to invite everyone to turn on their camera so we can have a photo opportunity with our speaker. Um, while you are doing that and fixing your hair, let me also invite everyone to the seminar next month. We have um, Professor Yustun Kwa from Nanyang Technological University speaking on November 3, and also um, Professor Norita Rui from University of Hawaii speaking on November 17. And we invite everyone to visit our website where you can download um, most of the materials from the seminar. Okay, so are we ready 